imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <laughs> Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about it, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. <coughs> Virtually I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give from the life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Today. One of my legs isn't working so great today, so uh, and I don't have a sermon written, so therefore I'm going to sit. And just talk. Um, so these, these readings today begin with the one from Kings about the prophet Elijah. And Elijah, you may know, is not one of the prophets who actually wrote things. I'm like Isaiah. And Ezekiel and others that actually wrote things. Isaiah wrote a lot of things, and so did Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Um, but Elijah was before them. So the time that Elijah lived was back in around 800 BC, and that was after King David and King Solomon, at a time when much of the northern part of Israel had had left their trust in God, and many of them had begun to worship other gods. And so there was a king named Ahab, and he had a wife named Jeze Jezebel, and that's part of the reading for today. But what you don't see in the reading for today is what came before that. Before that, there had been a contest between, um, between who, who am I talking about? Elijah. <laughs> between Elijah and Jezebel, who wanted people to worship Baal and other gods. So this contest consisted of all of the other representatives of the other gods brought their sacrifices to be offered to their gods, and Elijah brought his one sacrifice. And the contest was that those who worship other gods were waiting to see whether or not Elijah's God, who is Yahweh, our God, the Hebrew God, could outperform the other gods. In other words, demonstrate Yahweh's power. They wanted something to show what the power was. So what ended up happening is Elijah, not only did he bring his own sacrifice, he let the other gods choose the sacrifice he would bring. And so it was a calf, which is often used as sacrifice in those days. Not only did he bring the calf, he also brought buckets and buckets and buckets of water and doused the calf with it. But nonetheless, Yahweh accepted the sacrifice. 
us, and that was known by the fact that a fire began. And all the other sacrifices of all the other Baalist gods didn't work because there was no fire. And those, those people who represented those gods began to pray to show the power <coughs> of Baal. Uh, but it didn't work. And so the God that Elijah worshipped did set his sacrifice on fire, which means that uh, that sacrifice was accepted by Yahweh. So what happened after that was Jezebel got really upset because she was afraid. She was afraid of the power that uh, had been demonstrated by Elijah, and so she sent people to find him because she wanted to kill him. So he runs away. And that's where the story begins today. So he goes under this, what they call a bush, like a broom that was really probably like campus grass. It wasn't much, much protection for him. And so you hear his plea, and his plea is, God, take me out of this mess. I'm fearing for my life, I don't know what to do. So he lies down and goes to sleep, and he's awakened by what he perceives to be something feeding him. And he's really not sure where, where, sure where it comes from, but he eventually learns, after getting this thing happening to him a second time, that it was from God. And God says, okay, get up, go on your way, continue on your journey. No matter how difficult it is, we want you, I want you to continue on that journey. So he does, and you see he stays 40 days more and ends up being fed from wherever he gets fed from. So let's fast forward about 400 years. There was a discovery that I read about last week in the Guardian magazine. I don't know if you guys read that, but it's a British journal, and it's sort of dedicated to science, but um, it talks of a discovery that was made very recently by an archeological dig, and the guy that was running the archeological dig was being interviewed by the Guardian, and he told of what he found. And what he found was in the uh, Nile Peninsula of Egypt, he found all these artifacts that demonstrated all the different things that the people of that time, aged around 400 BC, used as sacrificial worship. And it was very clear to him from what he found there that this is the purpose of it. So what that tells me is, yeah, Elijah won that battle, right? And his calf was sacrificed properly, but no one believed him. No one believed what he had to say. And so the history of Israel is that the northern kingdom that Elijah was speaking to was in fact conquered by Assyria in, in the 700 BC period after Elijah. So no one heeded what Elijah had to say about worshiping Yahweh, his God. And so they were captured, um, taken by the Assyrians, and never returned. And then there were other prophets that we have, as the ones I spoke of earlier, that were talking to the kingdom of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. They were saying the same thing. They were saying the same thing Elijah had said, worship Yahweh. Yahweh is your God, but they weren't listening, uh, e even to Isaiah and Ezekiel. Um, and so guess what happens to them? They get captured by Babylon in 597 and taken away into slavery. So that's, that's that part of the history. And it wasn't until Christ came uh, in around 1 AD, and there began to be a new form of worship. And the new form of worship is what we're told about today in the New Testament by Paul and what we're told about in the Gospel of John in that reading. So you can imagine all those hundreds and hundreds of years that passed before Christ came and the different types of worship that were being used by different people because they didn't trust in the power of God. And that term power and greatness and grandeur was something they all believed in. 
because they believed that God showed God's greatness and God's love and God's protection by power. And in fact, I had a professor in seminary, uh, his name was Peter Carnley, he was Archbishop of Australia. And the first thing he wrote on the blackboard when he taught the first day of class was, God is that which nothing greater can be imagined. So I was wondering when I saw that on the blackboard, what does it mean to be great? What is it that we have to imagine about God and how we define greatness? And I've come to the conclusion with all of my studies and all of my work and all of my working with this parish and other parishes where I've been, that greatness isn't always defined by power. Love is defined by power and power is defined by love. And that's what we learn from Christ. That's what we learn from Paul's letter to the Ephesians today. That's what we learn from Jesus telling the people in the Gospel of John that the power was in his own weakness. The power was in his submission to other power. Jesus' greatness was not defined by power. When Jesus came into the world, he came only as a small babe in a manger. No one would have thought this was the Messiah that had been foretold, but this was the Messiah that they would have expected. And all of the people that followed Jesus were looking for signs. They're always looking for signs and miracles and power. And the biggest sign, of course, they didn't realize at the time, the biggest sign of Christ's power came in God's love and Christ's sacrifice on the cross, which is where our power comes from, is that sacrifice. But how hard is that for us to learn? And over how many decades and centuries have, been, have we been trying to learn that? Look around us, how often do we see power as something to be manipulated and used to subjugate other people, to hold under our feet those who are marginalized. This week I spent some time in dialogue with someone from our parish. He and I differ on politics, but we attempt to have respectful conversation. Um, but for this parishioner, power is defined by greatness and how we need to become more great. So my discussions with him are, what do we see in Jesus? How, how do you find that power in Jesus? And I think this is what the Gospel of John is telling us today that the power of love is so much grander than the love of power. And when my theology professor in seminary defines God as that which nothing greater can be imagined, I don't think it means greater in terms of what can do, what God can do, for us in the way of making us more powerful than other people. Any more than I think Elijah actually knew what he was doing when he was calling on God's power for the sacrificial cow, nor any more demonstration of power that the gods of Bethel believed they could show the people around them in their own sacrifices. God's sacrifice for us in the body of Christ means to me that the love of power means nothing and accomplishes nothing. But the power of love can accomplish everything. So today, as we come forward to receive the communion and the body of Christ, 
And as we go forward this week in our journeys in the world and all the things that we do and the time we spend with our families, whether wearing masks or not, whether rinsing and washing our hands or not, whether spreading germs or not, the power of God's love can conquer and will conquer all that we see in the world around us, no matter where we are on the political spectrum. We always boil things down to politics, and I think that's a mistake. My dialogue with my friend from this parish about the power of love is something that I take to heart, and something that I believe in, and something that I believe this parish believes in. We had a pastor here for 30 years, from 1958 to 1989, Father Heidel. Under Father Heidel, about whom I know very little, but I've learned from some of our older parishioners, Vivian, you were here, uh, Pat was here, and I've learned that Father Heidel's love for his flock and for his congregation, and how he demonstrated that. After his pastoral responsibilities here, he, he was so ill that he had to quit. He had to stop. And the last time he was here, he was with an oxygen tank sitting in the front row, um, still demonstrating the power of his love for this congregation. So the question that I have for us going forward is, what do we take from that period of time in our parish? How do we carry it forward now in our parish? And that's a conversation that I'm going to have with Bishop Dietschy this coming Tuesday morning. He set aside two hours for me. I've never spent two hours with Bishop Dietschy before. <laughs> uh, so I intend to make good use of that time. Um, because there's a dialogue going on, as I mentioned to you in the past, called Episcopal Futures, where we're exploring who our parishes are and what we're doing to demonstrate God's love to our communities and to the world around us. And that's a conversation we're all going to be having together. And so I'm really happy that I'm going to get to have that time with Bishop Dietschy, which will also include Bishop Dietschy's plans for this parish and our plans for this parish. So I would really like to hear any of your views about that because I believe that this parish is a place that demonstrates the power of God's love and that we should not and we should not try to demonstrate power by any other means than God's love so I'm going to be leaving here tomorrow morning to go up to Massachusetts to see my daughter for her birthday. Then I'm going to be going off to a place that I've reserved where I can be on Zoom with the bishop for a couple hours. So send me your emails about anything you would like to tell me about your love for this parish and what it, what it means to you. And about how you intend to demonstrate Christ's love for the world in your life and in your day-to-day Activities, and I'll let the bishop know about that, and I think he will appreciate hearing all that you have to say about that. I don't know if you would call this a fireside chat or not. We don't have a fire, but, um, uh, but it's, it's felt really good for me to just be able to sit with you guys and, and, and talk with you from the heart about who we are um, and, and, and how we can go forward, not just as a Episcopalians, but as Christians, demonstrating God's love to our community around us. So please feel free. I, I will read all of your emails. Or you can text me if you have my phone number. If you don't, it's on a card at the back. And um, I will carry your message to the bishop because he too wants to carry our message to all those churches around us. Thank you.